Our next speaker is Jennifer Hahn. I'm going to, let me please introduce her. Many of you may not be familiar with her work, but after today you will be. Jennifer is a postdoctoral researcher at Washington State University, uh, a great research for uh, entomology. She's a former landscape architect, and she left the procession, that profession to pursue her scientific interest. She earned her PhD in plant biology, studying genetics to improve, improve plant breeding. She's currently researching the efficacy of, I'm probably gonna pronounce this wrong, Jennifer, help me out, metarhysium, a fungus that kills arthropods, as in varroa mites, to use as a biocontrol agent against varroa mites. She hopes to develop fungal strains with minimal negative impacts to honeybees. That's great. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, so, gl so glad to have you. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. And it is metarhysium, so you are pretty close in saying it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before I get started, I just have a quick response to one of the questions earlier about um, scutellata, the Africanized semen, because you were saying the differential, um, that they were being used first versus some of the other European semens. And I just a little plug for our lab. We have a new, well, new, She's a PhD student who is actually studying exactly that. She's gonna look at differential sperm survivals of different subspecies of honeybees. So hopefully in a few years, we'll have some good answers for that. Anyway, back to my talk. <laughs> so today I'm gonna to talk about, um, is varroa control possible without chemical miticides? Um, so there's general consensus among the beekeeping world that there are four major threats to bees, parasites, pathogens, pesticides, and poor nutrition. This talk will be focused on varroa, which is the major parasite if, of honeybees. If there is some time, not quite sure, but I might touch on some of the other uh, research that we're doing in our lab that touches on some of the pathogens and nutrition and pesticidal issues. But today I will be focused on the varroa. So at this point, hopefully many of you are at least familiar with what Varroa looks like, but if you aren't, here's a nice little image. Varroa are found on not only adult honeybees, but also on um, the larva and the brood. Right? And this is where the reproduction takes place. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But this is what the, honey, uh, the Varroa looks like on a honeybee. You can imagine it's fairly large in comparison to the overall size of a honeybee. So imagine, if this were you and you had a varroa on you, it would be the size of a dinner plate living on your back, feeding off of you. So these are real devastating parasites. For a long time, it was assumed that varroa feed on the hemolymph, which is the equivalent of the bee blood, if you will. Um, but recently, Ramsey published in 2019, they discovered that we, we were making the wrong assumption this whole time. Varroa are actually feeding on the fat bodies of honeybees, not hemolymph. This um, discovery is really important because fat bodies play critical roles in honeybee development and regulation. So fat bodies are important in detoxification. So if you think of um, a human liver and the roles that it plays in our bodies, the fat bodies play a similar role in honeybees. So you can imagine if a varroa is feeding off of them and um, disrupting those, then you will have issues with detoxification. It also plays a huge role in immune function. This is important because varroa are a vector of many honeybee viruses, including deformed wing virus. If you don't know much about this virus, the name kind of says it all. These bees come out with deformed wings. Um, they have problems flying. They have problems learning, their lifespans are shorter, lots of negative consequences. So varroa not only vector these viruses, but through feeding on the fat bodies, it lowers the immune defenses of the honeybees, making them even more susceptible to viral infection and damage. In addition, these fat bodies play a large role, a significant role in wax production, thermal regulation, production of fats and proteins, these are really important when you think about um, when it comes to overwintering your bees and survival. Fat bees can come out better if they can um, go into the winter a little bit fatter, right? They come out in the spring a little bit better. And so if you have varroa that are just feeding on your um, fat bodies, 
they are less likely to survive overwintering. So there's a lot of evidence pointing at varroa damage leading to um, a lot of the overwintering losses that we see today. So just quickly about varroa biology and reproduction, if you guys aren't aware of how it works. Just gonna go with very basically. So queen lays her egg, it develops for a few days. Here at day eight in orange, um, day eight in orange, you can see the varroa enters the uncapped brood cell and it literally hides. It really will go down to the bottom and hide so it doesn't get detected and removed from the brood cell. Once this cell has been capped, the varroa moves out and it pokes a hole in this poor helpless larvae and starts feeding. Okay, so this is what's happening here around day 10. Around day 12, this foundress mite, which is what we call the first mite to enter that brood cell, lays her first egg. This first egg is an unfertilized egg and will develop into a male. Very similar to honeybees, um, unfertilized eggs become males, fertilized eggs become females. So here on day 12, um, the first egg is laid and it is always a male. All subsequent eggs afterwards are females. And so that begins every 30 hours afterwards. So you can imagine throughout this developmental period, this foundress mite is laying eggs continuously. By the time we get to day 18, this is about when the male that was that first egg that was developed um, that was laid, the male, is finally sexually mature. So shortly after he matures, about 30 hours later, the females, his sisters or siblings, begin to mature. And within this capped cell, um, this is where mating happens. Sibling mating happens, right? And by the time the workers emerge on day 21, they emerge with the fully mated and mature females in addition to the foundress mite. All of the, um, the male mite stays here in the bottom of the cell as does the unmature females and the unmated females. What's important to note here is a difference between um, workers and drones. Drones take longer to develop and therefore more um, female mites have the opportunity to complete their development and to get mated. So to sum up, Vroa reproduce within um, brood cells and they reproduce better within drone cells than they do worker cells, okay? So this is all about Varroa biology. We understand that, but there are thresholds, right? We all, I think it's, pretty much common knowledge at this point that if you don't treat or do something about your varroa, your hives will have problems. So the question is, how do you know when to treat? And the most important thing is to monitor your hives regularly for varroa numbers. Um, and the most, I suggest you uh, monitor using what we call either an ethanol wash, an alcohol wash, or a mild detergent soap wash. Um, there is a powdered sugar shake method that is also effective. Um, I just find that the um, ethanol or alcohol soap washes are a bit more effective. Some people monitor the varroa using sticky boards or they look at drone broods or they just visually examine their bees on their frames. While you can do this, this is actually not a very good measure for your varroa population. By the time you can usually see them um, visually, it's probably way beyond threshold already. So these are guidelines for when you should treat. Um, here, in general, it's about when you're at two to 3% or about two mites per every 100 bees. So here they have um, divided it out between different stages of the colony life throughout the year, whether it's increasing in the spring where it's at peak population in the summer or when it's starting to go down or when it's dormant, dormant and not reproducing say in the winter. But in general, when you're at about two to three mites per 100 bees, that is when you want to treat. Um, I'm not gonna go over in detail the methods of the ethanol wash and the powder sugar shake. 
However, um, you guys can go to this website. It's honeybeehealthcoalition.org slash Varroa. Um, and on this website, there's a lot of really good free tools for people to um, use. There's a lot of good videos, um, articles and PDFs talking about different ways to monitor Varroa, different ways to control, a lot of really great information. So I suggest you guys um, check that out when you have the time. So now you know you should monitor and these are the thresholds you have for treating. So how do you treat? So there are different ways of dealing with Varroa. There's different cultural methods such as um, starting with mite resistant breed stocks. Um, so some of these are like the hygienic bees that are around. Um, and there are different ways that bees can evolve mite resistance. So there are several kinds of stocks out there that have different mechanisms to be varroa resistant, whether it's through hygiene, whether it's through uncapping brood or um, recapping brood, or whether or not it's, there might be some changes um, within the chemical cues because they have found that some um, varroa are unable to recognize the brood cells and know when to in, uh, start reproduction. You can also do things like um, induce brood breaks or make splits. However, there are some drawbacks, right? These are labor intensive things. You have to requeen and your new queen may not take or you have to um, cage your queen. You may, um, when you make a split, this may affect your honey production if that's partly why you're keeping bees. So these are all things you need to um, keep in mind and decide whether or not these methods will work for you. Another um, chemical free control method would also be drone brood trapping, which I think some people may have touched upon earlier. It's where you set up your brood, um, your drone brood comb and basically set it up as a lure for the varroa to come in. And this is this can work, um, but it is seasonal, right? Your hives aren't always producing drones. So this isn't gonna work year round. In addition, this is a time um, labor intensive process, right? You're gonna have to go through each hive, each frame and remove these drones before they emerge. And this is important because if you do not remove these drones before they emerge, what you're doing is more or less releasing a mite bomb into your own hive and apiary, right? So again, this can work maybe for small operations who only have a few hives and have plenty of time and a free schedule to um, stay on top of this, right? But someone who has maybe a hundred or so hives or maybe even 20 hives, this may not be a practical solution. So the question again, is varroa control possible without chemical miticides? There is some literature suggesting that, yeah, it might be possible as there are some varroa resistant colonies that seem to be out there. I, however, am a little bit reluctant to say it's completely possible, yes. I'm more in the maybe category, okay? I feel like a combination of a lot of these methods would be um, important. And the most important thing is to monitor your hives regularly. And if your Varroa reach threshold or go above threshold, it's really important to do some sort of intervention to knock those Varroa numbers down, right? And so whether it is through drone brood trapping to knock those numbers down, or whether it's through um, making splits, caging the queen, right? Because if you cage a queen, you cause a break in the brood cycle, which inhibits varroa reproduction because they cannot reproduce without that brood. However, the cultural mechanical methods may not be enough. And if they aren't enough, it is really important, like I said, to do something because in general, without treatment, varroa infected hives will die. And so there are met, um, chemical miticides that are out there that are available. And I have loosely, if you will, um, categorized them into hard chemicals and soft chemicals, if you will. So some of the harder chemicals are amitraz and kumafos, right? So the trade names of apivar and checkmite. 
And there are some of the softer chemicals. These are the organic acids, such as oxalic acid, hops beta acid, which is derived from hops, which is hop guard. Um, things like hop guard and thymol are actually called biochemical miticides because these are chemicals that are derived from biological organisms. Each of these different treatments have their pros and cons. Um, some of them may be really good, but they also have different effects on brood mortality. It might have effects on queen egg laying and queen reproduction. Some of these different treatments um, will be temperature sensitive. It might be time sensitive. Some may or may not be able to be used with supers. So please always read the labels when deciding what to use. So again, I cannot emphasize this enough. It is really important to monitor your hives regularly. I think it's recommended that you do it about four times a year, okay? Just as a course of habit to just always check to see what your levels of varroa are. And for some, using mite resistant stocks and using drone brood trapping and some of these other methods may work. But again, if these don't work, there are um, other, options out there. However, like I said, there are some drawbacks and especially for some of these harder chemicals. Specifically, not only are there um, drawbacks for negative health effects in bees, but there's also a lot of mounting evidence that Varroa themselves are resistant to some of these common acaricides. So this is back in 2004. So what, 17 years ago, we knew about Kumafos resistance here in the US. This was a, a more recent paper of Amitraz resistance here in the US. Um, and again, this isn't just here in the US, this is a worldwide phenomenon and problem. So there's resistance here in Israel, in the UK, in Mexico, and these are two all sorts of different chemi chemical miticides out there. So with this growing body of resist chemical resistant um, populations of ROA, there is a need for an alternative control measure. And so this is kind of where our research comes in um, that I've been doing here at Washington State University. So in the introduction, they kind of said that I was a plant biologist and a landscape architect. And this is really what got me into looking at mushrooms is the idea of breeding tolerance and resistance into um, different organisms. So I got really interested in the fungi, first through the edibles such as morels um, and if you guys know chanterelles or percinis, I'm a big fan of them and uh, living out here in the Pacific Northwest, they're abundant in our woods. So it's a fantastic thing to do as a hobby. Um, but these aren't the mushrooms I'm gonna be talking to you about today. So metarhizium is what we call um, an entomopathogenic fungi, which is a big mouthful of words, but it, you can break it out down into its, um, constituent parts to help it make sense. So pathogenic, right? Meaning a pathogen, an entomo, if you think of entomology, right? It's a pathogen of insects, these fungi. And so this is typic a typical image of what these insects could look, or um, these fungi can look like. Some of them can grow these mushroom bodies like you see here. And some of them look much more mold-like, like this one here or this one here, right? And so what I'm working with and what we um, as a research group have looked at is metarhizium. So this is an entomopathic fungus, like I said. And what's really great about this is it's a native fungus. When I say um, native, I don't just mean here to Washington state where I am. It is in the soils here in Washington, in New Mexico. It's throughout the US and not just the US, it is found I believe on every single continent on this planet, except for Antarctica, and it might be there, just haven't looked. But the fact that it's native is really important and key in terms of a, developing a biological control agent because there is a real concern about introducing um, something non-native to an environment and how it may disrupt um, the ecosystem, right? There's a very famous study in Australia where they introduced cane toads to deal with the sugar cane um, beetle and it ended up running rampant. The cane toad became an invasive species and became an own invasive pest in itself and began um, 
dislodging native frogs and toads, right? So introducing in uh, non-native species as a biological control agent has some real um, precautions that you have to take with that. However, since this is found throughout the world, it's not a big deal. We don't have to worry about that, which is fantastic. The other great thing that metarhizium has going for it is it's already been EPA approved safe for human contact and consumption. And in fact, there are other some strains of metarhizium that have been approved for use in like restaurants and kitchens for controls of like ants and termites. This is an important thing because um, that means that this treatment has a potential to be used during honey flow, which very few treatments out there do. I think hop guards allowed, and there might be a couple other ones that you can do during the honey flow, but most you can't. So this is a fantastic other bonus that it has going for it. In addition, there's a lot of studies that have been done that shows that um, metarhizium is not a good um, killer of honeybees. And so studies were done back in the early 90s early 2000s by some USDA researchers, USDA researchers looking into using metarhizium as a biological control agent for Varroa. However, this line of research was dropped, I think for a variety of reasons, one of which was there was variability in the efficacy of the fungus, depending on what strain they used. And they also realized that this um, fungus had issues with thermal tolerance, meaning it couldn't handle the heat of the beehives, right? So if you think about it, um, this fungus is a, typically likes to live in the soil. And if you can imagine the soil temperature is much cooler than what you would find inside a beehive, right? Beehive, bees thermoregulate their hives to be about 90 some degrees equivalent of 35 C. So when I did an experiment, you can see that if I store the metarhizium spores at beehive temperatures here, and then try to germinate them at um, a good room temperature, temperature they like, they have this very short, what we call germination tube, which is kind of a measure of robustness for the spore. However, if we store them at four degrees, right, a refrigerator or a much cooler temperature, more typical to what you would find underground, you can see how robust this growth is. The same goes for if I store the spores at high temperatures, but then try to grow them at low temperatures, we still have this short germination tube, this stunted growth. And it is even more exaggerated when you look at um, spores that have been stored at high temperatures and then germinated at high temperatures. This effect is even more exaggerated. So, I mean, this is part of the reason why I think this research into metarhizium was not pursued is there is this fundamental issue with thermal tolerance within this um, species of fungi. So our lab did a lot of work and what we did called directed evolution to improve its efficacy against rural mites by improving its thermal tolerance and also improving its virulence, its ability to infect and kill Varroa. So we went about this through a process called directed evolution. You can think of it as artificial selection, if you will. So I don't know. I like to use plant analogies because I come from a world of plants and I think people are familiar with them. So if you think about um, the parental plant is, was a brassica a long time ago, but you can through artificial selection, or if you want to call it directed evolution, we have changed this ancestral parental plant to be all sorts of different things that we see today, right? So Brassica, um, Oleraceae originally was a parental line, but we have bred it to become what we now know as kale, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts by selecting for different things. So I've taken that same idea of selection repeatedly over several generations, to develop thermal tolerance and virulence. So the way that we go about doing this, and I'll kind of explain this figure up here, is we grow mitospores, which is basically a colony of the fungus on a dish. But we grow it, this is on a very happy, um, this is a very happy fungus growing on the complete media. 
but we grow it either on um, an oxidative stress treatment. Basically we subjected it to hydrogen peroxide or we subjected it to nutritional stress where we grew it on basically plain agar with very little nutrition. So it was always slightly starved. We grew it up until we got these spores, which we call conidia or mitospores, if you will. We collected them and then we plated them out and grew them up again. But each time we grew it up at successive temperatures, right? So we started off with one, we grew it up at like 26 degrees. See what came up, uh, Ray ramped up the temperature again to like 26 and a half degrees, took out the ones that didn't sporulate, kept the ones that were good, replated them, increase the temperature. And we kept doing this over and over and over again until we reached our target temperature. And that's how we um, incorporated thermal tolerance into our strain. We also did a selection for virulence. Oops. And what this is here is we took our spores from here, from this process, and we treated hives with it. And we plated and counted varroa that we collected off of them, put them on plates, selected the spores that came out of the varroa that killed the fastest and the best, and then plated them up and treated the hives again. So we were continuously retreating the hives with the most infectious spores possible. This was done numerous times to many hives. This is maybe not even an eighth of the number of plates that I've plated counting mites. I think we counted something over 50,000 mites was counted and scored and tracked for um, its virulence and its vigor. And this was all done in an apiary. And by the end of it, what we see here, so here is our parental strain that I've grown up at the elevated temperature of beehives, 35C. And this is our final strain that we have germinated at 35C. And you can see that they are clearly different. Our final strain has longer germination tubes here, which again is a measure of its robustness. And it also has a higher percent germination. So if you look here, these little almost, what is it? Mike and Ike's little candy rod shaped things. These are the spores. And the ones without these little tubes have been ungerminated, right? They haven't germinated. Whereas our final strain, there are some ungerminated spores, but they're few and far between. So if you look at our final or starting parental strain versus germinated versus ungerminated, and then our final selected strain, which we designated as JH 1078, we're getting a much higher rate of germination at elevated temperatures, which is exactly what we wanted to see. So we did all of this, we treated our hives, and the way we treated our hives was growing it up on Petri dishes, simply inverting them and putting them in between the hive boxes or the top box and the lid. We did this because this was a small, scale experiment and easy to do. And what you can see is that over time, we have increased its virulence um, gauged by its percent mycosis. And we've also increased the duration of the treatment, which you can tell by this blue line. So in the very beginning, the duration of the treatment was quite short over time. But by the end, it was quite long. This treatment was lasting longer in the hive. Um, showing that our thermal tolerant strain is surviving and living longer there. In addition, you can see that our hives that were treated with metarhizium survived much longer than our control hives, suggesting again that this is working. And so we wanna do a direct measure of our metarhizium strain against a typical uh, Varroa treatment. We chose oxalic acid because this is one of the softer um, Mitocides that you can use, it's a more organic, softer acid. And what we did was we either treated the hives with oxalic acid with a dribble, or we treated it with colonized grains of rice. So these are rice that we grew our metarhizium fungus on, and we put them in these natural banana fiber bags, and we place them in the hive using a spacer. 
And what you can see is the bees were really enthusiastic about cleaning this up. They were able to chew through um, the mesh bag, open it up and disperse the grains throughout the hive. This is really important for us because it is the spores that are the infectious agents. So it's a really great um, tool that we can use to uh, harness the uh, behavior of the, the bees themselves who want to clean up their hives and use that behavior to help spread the treatment. And so how well did this work? Well, I'm very happy to report that this worked just as well as oxalic acid at keeping our mite levels below threshold treatment, which is exactly what we wanted to see. So this suggests that we have developed a novel biological control method for dealing with Varroa, right? So this is one of the first control methods that are, is non-chemical control, right? This is a biological control, but it's not a chemical control, which is fantastic. And I think it's a really great alternative out there um, for people because in general, biological control agents, it's harder for um, pests like Varroa or any other pest to develop resistance against a biological control. It's much easier for them to develop resistance against a single compound or chemical. And I could talk more about that later if there are questions. Um, I would like to say that the results of this work has led to a preliminary patent with the WSU, which is great because this is a first starting step to having this developed as a true biocontrol agent that will be EPA approved for use against Varroa. So the next steps in seeking EPA approval, which we are doing now, is to figure out what is um, basically application directions, right? What is the minimum dosage? What's the maximum dosage? And how are we going to deliver it to the beehives? I said previously we were using Petri dishes, and we've also used these little bags of grain but they're not exactly the most efficient way. So we were looking at other methods, including growing it um, on impregnated inert fabrics, such as felt. But we quickly learned this is, again, like growing it in Petri dishes. This is fine to do on a small scale, but if you want to grow this in bulk and have this as a real world solution for many beekeepers, this is not um, a practical solution. So from there, we moved on to grains to grow this fungus on. Growing fungus on grains is a very typical method that exists out there. Um, and so we did a bunch of experiments looking at different types of grains that are available. Um, and what we discovered was that pearl barley and rice seem to be the best uh, mediums for this fungus to grow. And so we moved from these flasks, small flasks, where I was growing maybe 100 grams of grain to these big mushroom grow bags where I can now grow kilos at a time, upping our production scale to something that is much more reasonable. So now that we figured out how we're gonna grow it, what we're gonna grow it on, the question is how are we gonna get it to the bees? And so uh, again, this is what we did on our first trial where we used these banana fiber bags and put them in the hive. However, there were some issues here. I didn't feel like I could get enough treatment to be as effective as I wanted it to be. In addition, these bags require the use of a spacer. And I found, I don't know about um, your guys' experience, but our bees did not behave normally when we added this spacer to the hive. They had a hard time finding uh, the box above it, and it was just not a good time. So we had to rethink everything, and how else are we gonna get this there? So we looked at other materials, including burlap, to see if we can make thinner, different bags, but we, what we ended up choosing was actually a rather simple thing, where we made wax paper envelopes that were long, flat, and thin. And this was great because bees will chew it up it will decompose and it's fantastic in that way. Um, yeah. We also wanted to look at how can we increase the longevity of the spores in the hive? And there's a lot of research saying that if you add grease or some sort of oil adjuvant, it can help increase it. 
So we formulated a grease patty, if you will, and instead of adding pollen or other nutrient supplements to it, we added a little bit of sugar, um, but we just mixed it up with our colonated, uh, colonized grains and we added it to the hives, um, adding slits to help the bees access it. And what we have found, so this is ongoing work that's going on right now. It's still going on right now. So these are very preliminary results. But basically what we have found is that our metarizium, newly formulated metarizums grown on grains and put in bags or in grease formulations seem to be just as good at keeping the varroa populations in check as oxalic acid. Um, we are also gonna be testing it against hop guard and some other common um, varroa control measures just to see how efficacious it is compared to some standard treatments out there. So this is really, really exciting news for us because this is showing us that, hey, this is working guys. This is exactly what we wanna see. So I've mentioned oxalic acid over and over again, and there is kind of a reason for it. It's not just because um, we like to use it here just because it's a mild organic, uh, treatment or mild organic acid, sorry. Um, but also I'm really interested in oxalic acid because this is produced naturally by many organisms, including metarizium. So metarizium will make oxalate crystals out of their hyphae. And so I was wondering, well, what if they could work together, right? Why don't we all just work together? So I had a master's student who graduated in 2019 explore the synergistics effect of metarizium with oxalic acid. And this was a very controlled experiment all done indoors and, you know, in a lab. But what she found out was when you spray um, Froa with oxalic acid, just like you think, you get mortality. However, if you spray Varroa with a mixture of oxalic acid that has had spores added to it, your mortality greatly increases, which is super exciting. Because this kind of gives us ideas that, well, maybe if um, metarizium can be used in conjunction with oxalic acid to get even better control, or there are, there's um, oxalic acid, is not entirely completely safe for bees either. There is an upper limit, which isn't super strong, right? And so if we can lower the concentration of oxalic acid that we apply to our hives, we can minimize the negative effects of the, um, that treatment while also adding um, higher control by the addition of metarizium. So this is a really promising avenue of research that I'm really excited to pursue. We've also had a really fun study with um, Riley Schultz, who recently graduated here from WSU, where she looked at how metarizium affected honeybee health. And what she found, and we did this study all indoors in cages, uh, was she found that when she did a longevity study with um, cages that were either treated with metarizium or not treated with metarizium, the bees in the cages with metarizium lived longer which is fascinating to think about, like what is going on? Cause they weren't, it's not necessarily because of Varroa drops that they were living longer. So there's something interacting between the metarizium and the honeybee biology that's helping increase the longevity of these bees. So I'm really excited. There's gonna be some more work done to try to explore exactly what's going on inside the honeybee um, immune system and honeybee uh, yeah, biology to figure out and the physiology to figure out what's going on. I wanted to quickly bring this up. I know it's a big graph that means probably very little to many people, but <laughs> what this is basically showing is that this is part of Raleigh's studies that when she treated those cages um, with metarizium, the bees in the cages with a lot of metarizium had an increase in expression of this one gene called Dicer. Dicer is a gene that is involved in the RNA degradation pathway. Now, this is really important because a lot of these really um, important B viruses are RNA viruses. So Dicer plays a huge role in destroying and degrading these viral RNAs. So the idea that metarizium 
is increasing the regulation of dicer implies that you might by applying metarizium, you might also be able to help increase your um, control of some of these viruses that you're seeing in your hives. So this is very preliminary research, but I'm really excited to explore this further to see how metarizium affects honeybee health, not just um, varroa control. All right, I think I've got a little more time. So I'm also gonna be talking, just wanna mention really quickly, oh, the other thing about Riley is I want you guys to keep a lookout for her because she is now a master's student at Purdue University where she's also going to be studying honeybee health. So I look forward to seeing what else she has to offer. Okay, finally, I want to talk about Anna Webb. She recently received her master's um, from WSU in spring of this year. And she did a study where she was looking at the effects of indoor storage on different varroa treatments. And she looked at metarizium and oxalic acid. I know there's three categories here. It says indoor unstable. I kind of want you guys to ignore this graph here, mainly because unstable meant that she had two indoor container storage units and the unstable one, like the name implies, was rather unstable. The temperature fluctuated up and down. And we had issues um, regulating the gases in there. So the CO2 levels rose and dropped um, quite dramatically. And so I, this data is a little bit hard to interpret. What I really want you to focus on though, is that with indoor storage, and what indoor storage does is um, it forces a break in the brood cycle, right? Now this is important because like I said, um, Varroa reproduce in the brood. And there are some treatments that are just ineffective. They cannot get through that capping. And so if you induce a brood cycle, you uh, brood break, excuse me, um, you more or less expose all of the varroa to be on adult honeybees and not within capped brood. So you can sometimes, the idea is that you might be able to have a better control by using indoor storage. And what we can see here is that pre-treatment and post-treatment, there are drops, right? However, it looks like those that were in the indoor storage did have a higher reduction in Varroa levels, suggesting that maybe there are ways that you can um, incorporate multiple methods for Varroa control, right? You can combine indoor storage or brubic with some of these other control methods to gain better efficacy. Um, and I wanted to briefly mention before I end that Brandon Hopkins, who I'm, a, hope, I'm assuming some of you may be aware of, um, he's a, another researcher here at Washington State University. His lab is also looking at indoor storage and how they can combine that with, like I said, different varroa treatments, including mass fumigation. While this may not be as applicable to some people here who only have a few hives, this is a really great innovation for some of the commercial guys who are storing thousands of hives in these massive warehouses at a time. Um, so it's really exciting to see the developments in varroa control that are out there. Jennifer? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. I just wanted to tell you, you have plenty of time left. You've got at least 15, 15 more minutes before we even go to uh, Q and A, so take your time. Ah, okay, great. This is what I get for not having a clock in my office. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess, yeah, is varroa control possible without chemical miticides? Again, my answer is maybe, but I think the future is bright. I think that in the near future, I think it might be possible. But again, always monitor regularly and treat when necessary. Right. I, one of the things that I love about um, working in this bee community is it really is a community and we need to be cognizant of others. And so when I say monitor regularly and treat when necessary, it's not just for you, right? It's not just because I want you to have healthy bees and not and your bees to not die, but also consider your neighbors. If you don't treat your bees and they are past threshold with varroa infestation, 
then that hive is destined, most likely destined to die. And when it does, what it does is it's going to spread its varroa and disease to neighboring colonies. They may be within your apiary, they may be your neighbor down the street. It may be the feral colonies that are out there in the wild. So you always consider the impacts of what you do, right? Everything we do has consequences. So keep that in mind. Um, and with that, I wanna just do a quick video. So these are Varroa that, live Varroa that I dipped in my metarhizium spore solution and I played it on a water auger plate. I took some time-lapse video. You can see as they're dying here, they're curling up, their legs curl up. And the fungus is now colonized within the Varroa and is now busting out. You can see as it goes through the exoskeleton, it turns white and what you see here green are the spores. So this is what Varroa death by metarhizium looks like. And it's, I, I kind of love it. Um, and with that, since I do have a little bit of time, I want to quickly mention some of the work that we've done with the other fungal work we've done um, in our lab that I'm really excited about. And so this is some of the fungal extract work that we've done. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it at all, but this was done in collaboration with Dr. Nager and Dr. Shepard um, at WSU. And this all started kind of from you guys in a way. It started off with anecdotal stories of, I've seen my bees foraging on mushrooms. You know, I've seen my bees foraging on mushrooms. And so we had Paul Stamets here found bees foraging on his mushrooms. And he just happens to be, um, runs uh, Fungi Perfecti, a company that grows mushrooms, gourmet mushrooms for consumption. And so he got in contact with us here at WSU and said, hey, my bees are on these mushrooms that are growing, what's going on? And the more we looked into it, we found that, yeah, no, this is a thing bees do. So these are photos taken by Jay Evans, who is a USD researcher over in um, Maryland, where he also went out and found bees just foraging on different mushrooms. And what they're foraging on, it looks like are what we call exudates, very technical term. It's almost like mushroom sweats, if you will, where they have too much liquid and they, exude it out of their skin. So you'll see like droplets of liquid on the surface of some of these mushrooms. And it seems to be that this is what these bees are foraging on. So the question is why, why would bees do this? Are they self-medicating maybe? And so we decided to explore this. So we had um, Paul Stamets who owns Fungi Perfecti who already grows these mushrooms and makes fungal extracts for human consumption. We had them grow out these fungi and make these extractions. And they handed them off to us where we then began to test them and feed them to bees to see what effects um, these are having within the bees. And what did we find? Something really exciting that I'm really excited about. Um, bees that were fed these fungal extracts, their viral levels dramatically decreased like thousands fold decrease in reduction of viral levels. And so this wasn't, this was true across many species, um, but it seemed to have the highest effect in what we call the Ganoderma, um, Ganoderma, which is a genus of fungi. So Ganoderma has been known for thousands of years for its medicinal property. It's a very important fungus in ancient, um, Chinese herbal medicine, traditional medicine. So, um, and if you look it up on the internet, like PubMed or some of these medical journals, and if you look up Ganoderma, there are thousands of articles out there on the effects of Ganoderma on human health. So I guess it wasn't as surprising to find out that maybe Ganoderma does have some antiviral properties even within the bees. So not only is it great at reducing B levels, uh, viral levels such as DWV and LSV, when we took this into the lab and we did controlled um, cage studies, we also found that the Ganoderma extracts was the best at helping bees survive longer in cages. And so there is something going on here where the uh, fungal extracts are helping with longevity and lowering viral levels. So the results of this, we decided to um, 
try to approach the FDA to get this product actually registered as a um, uh, bee product. FYI, bees are considered livestock and grouped with cattle and chickens. And so there are some stringent uh, settings that we have to follow. And there are many bee products that are already out there on the market. However, most of them are under the radar. F they aren't FDA approved or um, anything like that. And so if you do go out and buy some other products, just make sure that the science is there. Anyway, we want to FDA, they wanted to know, are the extracts a food or a drug? Because if we make any claims about viral reductions, it's a drug. And then that follows a whole suite of regulations and things. If it's a food, they're a little bit less stringent. You can't make claims of antiviral cap capabilities, but they're less stringent on um, some of the wants they have. For example, if it's a drug, they want to know exactly what chemical is responsible for the drug activity in what exact proportions. And what we're doing is bulk extracts where there are hundreds of chemicals in there where we may not know exactly which one is the active chemical. So the FDA told us to approach AFCO, which is the Association of American Feed Control Officials. Basically what we do is um, if we apply for an AFCO definition as the extract as a feed um, supplement, a nutrient supplement, then it's a lot easier than for us to get FDA approval as well. It's, a much, it's almost like a fast track process if you go through AFCO and then the FDA. And so we know that these fungal extracts, we've done some studies to figure out it is definitely a nutritional component. Um, it does bring nutrition to the table. So here is an image of our fungal extracts. And I know it's just qualitative thing, but if you look at them, the colors of these are very similar to the range of colors you also find in honeys. In addition, when you do a nutritional analysis of these extracts, you find that it con contains several of the key nutrients and components that are important for bee survival. In addition, when you look at their minerals, the proportions that we find in the extracts are very similar to what we find in pollen, suggesting that this could be a very analogous to a bee nutrition. So we won't worry about that. So we're focusing mainly on the B vitamins and the minerals when we pursue, um, when we bring this up to AFCO as um, a definition for B supplements. However, there are things like polyphenols that have been found in the extracts. Um, and we know that they're there because, um, we know they're there. And these are really important because they're known to boost B immune system in the fight against different pathogens and other things. So again, this might be part of the um, antiviral properties. In addition for bee health, there are lots of chitin components within these fungal extracts. So if you aren't aware, fungi use chitin to make their cell walls. Insects use chitin in their exoskeleton. So these are important um, components. And when we make these fungal extracts, chitin ends up in these fungal extracts, which we hypothesize that the honeybees are using as well. So we are currently in the process of having a draft definition sent to AFCO where it will, fingers crossed, hopefully get approved by a local official who then takes it to the national official, then he votes on it. Anyway, hopefully by the end of this whole process, it'll be about a year we're hoping before we get word on whether or not this has been approved. In the meantime, we're very excited that we just hired on a new graduate student who will be doing more experiments to look at minimum dosages that are effective and then the maximum dosages. We're also looking at how this affects different components of the fungal bee immune system. So we're, again, we're just looking um, really interested in how these different treatments affect honeybee health, whether it's for the positive or for the negative. So, and with that, I will thank you and I will take questions. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Of course, this was fun.
Jennifer? You know, I, I just wanted to start out by saying that um, I think it's quite remarkable that you sort of started where a lot of other researchers were basically at a dead end. You know, multiple researchers that decided, you know what, this just isn't going to work. And you came up with this innovative way of breaching that, that barrier. It's really quite remarkable. Thank you. Um, I will say that part of this work, I would like to thank my funding for this work because this is very exploratory work. And I don't think it would have been possible without some of the money I got from some private foundations because it's really hard to get governmental grant money for a project where you're like, it may or may not work out. I can't promise anything. But um, it's been really exciting. And yeah, I'm really glad this has worked out. But it's been several years of, yeah, hard work. Jennifer, can you, so you um, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Randy. Oh, OK. Um, Christine Peng at UC Davis worked with Directed Evolution with uh, fungi back around 2000. She published uh, one paper in 2002, which didn't go into the Directed Evolution part of it. And she was working mainly with Hirsutella, Hirsu is the one that she narrowed down. And I've been eagerly awaiting anybody to pick up on directed evolution of fungi since then. So I've been following your work and I'm really excited about what you're doing because the directed evolution is, is everything. And, and one of the beauties of what you're doing as you implied is that when we, when we use a, um, a, a chemical, straight chemical, that is fixed. Um, it can't change. Whereas biology of the pest or pathogen or parasite, that will evolve and change. When you're using a, a, a living organism, such as metarhesium, which can also co-evolve with the, with the pest, now you're talking about long-term possible solutions rather than something that, we're gonna, that, that uh, might well develop resistance to. So I uh, commend you on your research and any way I can ever help you, let, let me know. Thank you. I think you put it exactly how, uh, how it is. Like, it's very easy to evolve Varroa to revol uh, evolve resist resistance against a single chemical compound. Oh, yeah. But it's a lot harder to evolve resistance against an organism, right? Yeah. So yeah, this is, I'm really hopeful that this is a road to a long-term treatment solution. Oh yeah, it would be great. Okay, let's see, uh, let's see if we can get to some of the other questions. Amy okay. Owen wants to know, what influences the bees to disperse the metarhesium? So I think some of this is just bee behavior. When you add something foreign into their home, they're gonna wanna clean it up and get rid of it. And so we kind of take advantage of that behavior and we put this in their hive to have them work it. We also, in the grease patty formulation, add some sugar to the grease to incentivize them to work it and spread it around the hives. Great. She also wants to know, is there any concern about this fungus becoming too virulent out in nature? Um, I mean, there's always a concern, right? Whenever you develop something new and you release it into the wild, what's gonna happen? However, um, we have not found any of those issues about it coming too virulent. And part of that is also because um, part of this virulence that it's gained is because of me, it's this artificial directed evolution change that I'm doing. And if you remove that external factor of selecting for it, you kind of remove that selection process. It's had every okay. opportunity to become virulent since yeah, time immemorial. Yeah, I mean, it's immemorial. been in the soil for <laughs> millions of years. Yes. <laughs> okay, another question um, from Katie Thompson. At what point is the benefit of starting with a native species derailed by the fact that the species is now modified through directed evolution to succeed in conditions it wasn't previously successful under? Um, well, it's true that we have through directed evolution made it successful in conditions it wasn't previously under, such as the high temperature. However, this metarhesium will not be in those conditions unless you put it there yourself, right? This metarhesium isn't gonna get inside the beehive very easily on its own without you putting it there. Does that make sense? Uh, I can't. <laughs> I think Hopefully. so. Uh, we don't have that um, back and forth with yeah. uh, Katie, so she could she could respond again if we have time at the end. But thank you. Um, 
the anonymous attendee is asking, how long do you leave your inoculation bags or envelopes in to treat a hive? Um, well, that's actually a great question in which I have to say it depends because currently we are doing the experiments right now to figure out what is the optimum time to leave them within the hive. So I can't give you an answer right now, but we're working on that answer right now. That's great. Uh, Amy Owen also asking, I'm assuming this metaresium only causes mite mortality in Varroa that's not in kept brood. I guess that would be phoretic, uh, phoretic mites. Does it survive long enough to treat throughout several brood cycles? Yes, we have found that it can, um, is definitely surviving for several weeks, over a month, couple months in the hives. Um, However, um, again, we're working on the treatment regime right now where I would suspect that you would want to do this treatment maybe every four weeks-ish, just applying a new treatment, but we're not, I can't make exact recommendations right now. But it is able to survive for several months in the hive. One of the issues with a biocontrol such as this is if you reduce this pest population down to close to zero, there's no food left for the biocontrol, to continue to replicate on. So um, <laughs> it's, it's guaranteeing you're going to have to repeat the treatment. Um, yeah. uh, we have the same problem with our mite resistant uh, B, B lines. The mite levels are so low in them that we can't see the mode of resistance that the bees are using because there's so, <laughs> there's so few varroa <laughs> mites in the dang colonies. Yeah, I mean, so I mentioned oxalic acid and we use this as kind of a softer treatment because part of it is we want to maintain varroa populations mm -hmm. in our yeah. hives too, so that we can run these experiments. Right. We, we actually do don't want to knock it down to zero. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Allison Moore has a question. Uh, in one of your earlier slides, it showed the product MET52. This product can be applied as a liquid drench or as a foliar spray on plants in the garden to treat for certain insects. As a gardener and beekeeper, if I apply this product to plants in my garden and then my honeybees fed off those plants, would they inadvertently take in some of that? Metaresium. 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 Yeah, um, that is entirely possible. Plants can act as a fomite, right? An, an object for which things to transfer. However, MET52 um, hasn't really been bred or designed for use in a beehive against Varroa. So I imagine that MET52 might not, again, it will probably have those thermal tolerance issues. So the bee might be able to bring it back to the hive, but I have, I'm very skeptical that it would survive long enough in the hive to be very effective. So that, yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, I have two questions I'm gonna to try to combine into one. Um, they're kind of related. Would it be useful to grow mushrooms in our yards for bee forage, or is there a homemade recipe for fungal extracts that we could use while we are waiting for your product to come out? Um, <laughs> as a fungal lover, I think it's always useful to grow mushrooms. Um, so I, I would never say no. But also some of these um, fungal mushrooms that we've tested for the extracts, such as Ganoderma, um, the reishi mushrooms, there's been some evidence for tramides. Some of these people grow anyway for medicinal purposes. Some of them people grow just to eat anyway. So there's no harm in growing mushrooms in your yard. And in fact, you might be able to get some good food or some, you know, medicine out <laughs> of it anyway. So I don't yeah. see why not. Um, and is there a homemade awesome. recipe for fungal extracts that we can use? I don't know if there's one out there online. I don't exactly know. I don't know, there might be one online, but in general, what the fungal extracts are, are they're ethanolic extracts. So we take the fungal mycelium. These aren't actually extracts of the mushroom bodies. It's actually the mycelium. So the white stuff that looks like a massive roots, if you will, if you're not familiar with fungal biology. And so we soak that in um, alcohol and ex do an extraction that way. Um, so yeah, I don't know, you might be able to find protocol online, but we don't actually do the extracts. Uh, Fungi Perfecti makes those extracts for us. I was so glad you brought in Paul uh, Stamets, uh, work, you know, collaboration with Paul because he's such a such a cool guy about mushrooms and how they potentially have tremendous benefit to the planet and to human 
humans. I'm going to ask you a question now that um, you may choose not to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know you work for the university and I used to work for a national laboratory and often the research we do is we're encouraged uh, to go out and do some things that might be classified as entrepreneurial. So I'm just wondering, have you, have you considered uh, the entrepreneurial aspects of what you've done, what you've accomplished? Yes, we so, have considered okay. that. Um, <laughs> this is going to sound weird. Mainly because at first we approached Fungi Perfecti and Paul and asked them if we get this you know, approved, would you guys be willing to license it and grow it out? And they thought about it and came back with a no. Mainly because the metarizium <laughs> is a spore producing fungus. And it's for him and his grow operations for human consumption gourmet mushrooms. This metarizium is like a large contaminant for him in his whole operations. Yeah. So if their operations were to grow it out, they would have to build a whole new facility just for metarizium. And so we decided we're gonna take it on. And actually, um, if people are, aren't aware, here at Washington State University, a couple of years ago, we recently purchased um, a bee building out in a fellow Washington. It's a new facility. And we're hoping to set up a pilot production plant out there where we can start growing this up in larger batches, as opposed to my one man lab, where it's me. So, so where should investors be sticking there? <laughs> <laughs> um, I can be reached okay. at Jennifer Ohan. Um, okay, all right. Direct deposits to me would be great. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just set up a Venmo. Yeah, that's all awesome. you got to watch FEC regulation here now, guys. <laughs> okay. oh, I'm Insider trading. I wasn't I wasn't sure if I said that out loud or not. OK, let's see. Um, Melanie Kirby wants to know, do you think climate change increases in, the climate change increase of temperature might affect it? Um, I don't think there's any way that climate change wouldn't affect what's going on in the world. I think yeah. all sorts of biology and ecology, there's no way things aren't gonna be affected by it. It may be not as affected just because bees try to thermoregulate their hives. So hopefully there isn't that much of a fluctuation on the in-hive temperatures going on, but you know, there's no way that it's not being affected. Okay, great. And I think we have one more question from Amy Owen who says the question is actually from one of our participants or one of our donors, Laura Lovell, says, I am curious if chalk brood will thrive or bloom in the hive uh, is it, as the conditions are ripe for metarizium. Ah, Okay, so yeah, if we make it happy for metarizium, we'll also be happy for chalk brood or some of these other fungal diseases. Um, I don't, know the exact answer to that right now. However, I can tell you anecdotally, we are running some experiments right now that I showed you with the metarizium and the grease and the bags and the oxalic acid. And what we are loosely finding actually is that our hives without metarizium seem to be the ones with the worst chalk brood problem. Hmm. So not exactly sure what's going on here, but it seems all the ones without the metarizium treatment seem to be having some real chalk brood issues. Great, and we do have a one more, one more, or maybe two more. <clears throat> Allison Moore asks, do you have any recommendations for dilution of reishi extract for use in sugar water in a hive? Um, we have been doing a 1% extract. So if you have a three liter in hive feeder, add 30 mils to your three liters, right? For a 1% extract, that's what we're using. Perfect, thank you. And <laughs> This could be our last question unless we get another one. <laughs> uh, Anita Amstutz wants to know, so increased heat in the hives will impact the fungi treatment given that you selected for a certain temperature. Um, that is true. However, I guess I didn't mention this. Um, the selection process, I mean, it didn't stop when we published that paper. So we are still continuing the selection process. And I don't see this process as ever having an end because, you know, like your parents have always taught you, you can do better, you can always do better. <laughs> so I believe we can always make this fungus a little better. And like you said, with climate change and just changing um, environments, I think it's important to continually select because 
if Baroa develops some way of getting some sort of little resistance, we have to keep selecting in exchange our fungus to make sure it's still effective. So I guess maybe I'll never job security for me because I will always have to do this. Well, it's wonderful. We will we will certainly be following your work, and I I you know I I love dad jokes, and so I may have a new dad joke because um, uh, I always used to talk about well I am a fun guy, but I'm a um, fun gal. Yeah, fun guy, but a fun gal. I never heard of fun gal, so <laughs> <laughs> fungal can be a fun gal. So. What a wonderful and exciting um, amount of research you've been doing. It's only gonna go great places from here. Listen, you got Randy, I mean, look at Randy. We knew his ears would perk up. <laughs> and so if we were in a live um, uh, in-person meeting, I guarantee you guys would be having dinner together tonight. <laughs> yep. <laughs> For sure. Well, hopefully in the, not, in the not so near, or in the near future, we'll have these in person. Yeah, I'm interested. I was looking at your culture cages, those the inverted cups and feeders. Um, much of that is my design that uh, they're using at USDA lab. And I'm running a, a cage trial right now myself too. So, yeah, uh, using that, the solo cups. Solo cups, and then I I using a different feeder than you are. So that's another uh, one that you might uh, be interested in. Oh, okay, that would be fun. Yeah, we'll have to talk well, later. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Jennifer, I must say, so far you've gotten the most questions, so congratulations. Well, thanks. I've had a really good time. It, there've been good questions, so. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. Bye-bye.